It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Laura Wood. Laura is the Kidney Cancer Clinical Trial Coordinator at the Cleveland Clinic. She will be outlining all the management of side effects for the various treatments of, for kidney cancer. So I am very appreciative of the invitation from the KCC to participate in today's conference and am delighted for the opportunity to share what some of the things that we have learned through our experience in the clinical trials and through clinical practice with these agents. So while some of the products I talk about may not be available here in Canada, the idea is to share with you what we have learned and then you can apply this then to products that may be available here and your healthcare oncology team can help you find and identify those things. As has been talked about before, immunotherapy, that's where we started. I was a staff nurse with Dr. Bukowski at the Cleveland Clinic when we did the clinical trials for high-dose interleukin-2, and that still plays a role in care of patients with clear cell kidney cancer. We are circling back to some of the immunotherapies. And so what the immunotherapies do is they stimulate the immune system to recognize kidney cancer cells as foreign, and therefore it's not surprising that the side effect profile that we often refer to as constitutional symptoms are almost a flu-like reaction. We have stimulated the immune system. So fever, chills, fatigue or malaise, changes in taste and appetite are common with that type of therapy. Hydocyl-2 is a short course of therapy where some of our newer immunotherapies may be longer course therapies, similar to what we're doing with the TKIs. One of the most important things I try to tell patients up front is that this is a chronic disease. Similar to diabetes, similar to some of our other chronic illnesses, we're going to manage and adjust your treatment as needed. And for those patients who are very anxious early on, if it's their new diagnosis, it's frontline therapy, I often introduce myself as their oncology nurse, but my real role is that of their tour guide. Everyone goes on a journey, some of which you choose. Sometimes you get sidetracked. Many times on your journey, you end up with a flat tire. So I'm here to help you get that tire changed, get you back on the road, and minimize the risk for future flat tires. So that's one of the ways I try to help patients and family members understand the course of their disease and treatment. The targeted therapies, as has been described earlier, the easiest way to understand the small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs as they've been referred to, is their oral drugs. You can see from the generic name on the left, they all end in inib. So they are small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They inhibit that vascular pathway. So they interfere with blood vessel development and the tumor's ability to get new nutrition. The mTOR inhibitors has described also temsorolimus, everolimus. You'll begin to see some similarities in the drug names. Bevacizumab in combination with interferon. Treatment-related side effects, then, are going to be somewhat class effects. Fatigue may come across the board, as well as diarrhea, mucositis, stomatitis, mouth inflammation or sensitivity is commonly with these agents, as well as taste changes, anorexia, hand-foot syndrome, and hypertension or high blood pressure. So these are some of the class effects that we'll see with these therapies. Hypersensitivity reactions can come with the IV infusions, such as bevacizumab or temsorolimus. So those are going to be things that your infusion nurse will educate you about and monitor you for during your treatment. Hyperglycemia, elevations in cholesterol and triglycerides will occur with the mTOR inhibitors. So think of mTOR, while it means and represents mammalian target of rapamycin, think of that lowercase m as being metabolic. So that class effect of drugs is going to cause metabolic abnormalities, blood sugar, triglycerides, and cholesterol. Pneumonitis also is a unique side effect with the mTOR inhibitors, and I'll talk more about things you need to be aware of and alert your healthcare team to. Management, number one, most important, it is what I practice, it is what I preach, and that is patient education. Following up on the earlier discussions, get your education however you can. If your oncology team should be able to provide that for you, go out and look at reputable websites, K 
KCC, the Kidney Cancer Association, the U.S. group. Again, those information pieces are available to you. Ask if you don't receive. Look if you're not sure. One of the things when these drugs first started to become approved in the U.S., the patient no longer had a research nurse. So they no longer had a one-on-one. -on -one. One of the things that we did was we then simply created the same patient education folders that we would give our research patients and put them in the physician workroom so they could grab them and pass them out to patients. The pharmaceutical companies all have information available, and chemocare.com is a website that we refer all our patients to. You're not getting chemotherapy unless you have papillary kidney cancer. Chemotherapy does not otherwise work in clear cell kidney cancer, but this website has a lot of general drug information and general side effect information. So again, that's a resource that's available as well. Proactive. You've got to be proactive. Understand your drug, how to dose it, how to take it, what are the potential side effects to be aware of. Call early, intervene early, reevaluate early and ongoing. This is the chemocare.com website. It is translated in several different languages, so it is available. Fatigue, one of the key things is it can be related to your disease, it can be related to your therapy, and actually it can be related to the effectiveness of your therapy. Keeping up those normal activities, adjusting things as needed to be able to maintain the dose and schedule of your treatment, while as importantly maintaining your work and your family and social life. Keeping up then with management, activity, and exercise. There's a lot of research that's been done that supports encouragement of exercise and maintaining activity. If you're used to golfing nine holes or 18 holes several times a week, please keep it up. I don't care if you get a cart, but do keep up the activity. It's as much physical as it is social and emotional, and you need to maintain that, and you need to get out of your spouse's hair. So again, go to work, love you dearly, go to work. Um, we will get things like a disability placard. I want you working. I understand you don't want to park in the back row. We'll get you up close, up front, so your energy and your emotional energy can be spent at work, not at the back end of the parking lot. Supportive care strategies. We get our palliative medicine team involved very early on. I don't know the terminology here in Canada, palliative medicine support, symptom management support, they are not to be feared. It is not that they're getting hospice involved. Hospice has a wonderful role in oncology care. They also are the gurus of symptom management. And so we may have a newly diagnosed patient who has a lot of disease-related symptoms. I need my pal med expert to help me allow that patient to stay on therapy with a good quality of life, and they can do some phenomenal things. So don't be afraid as additional experts are brought into your care. It is truly a team approach. Allowing family members and friends to help. We had a patient who actually, when she was first diagnosed, she had three kids under the age of seven. She got out of calendar and had one of her friends in charge of dinner hour. And so she literally posted up on Facebook a calendar as to who could bring dinner, what the kids' likes and dislikes were. Do not be bashful. The family member that doesn't want to try to figure out three different meals a day, that's where Ziplocs and freezers come in handy. You can have his side and her side. But again, allow your friends and those to help however they can. Diarrhea, mucositis, the GI side effects, we learned early on with these therapies that there's a difference between what's referred to as functional mucositis and clinical. And that guides your healthcare team as to what is the appropriate intervention. Taste changes, anorexia, these are ongoing issues. So again, trying to be creative. I am at times known as the diarrhea queen. And it is a hat I wear with pride because it is a chronic side effect with most of these therapies. But if we together can find a creative way to manage it, early and ongoing communication, you'll hear that repeated throughout, we can keep you on therapy, again, with a good quality of life. And you don't have to stop at every restroom between here and there. 
We've got using things over-the-counter products such as loperamide or Imodium. There are a variety of prescription medications that will be recommended. We've also gone to using um, psyllium products such as Benefiber or Metamucil. This is, again, where it's key for you to communicate with your healthcare team. Do not follow the instructions for which the drug or product was designed for. Benefiber, you're always told, take it with a full glass of water. In our patients with sunitinib or pazopinib, excitinib with the chronic diarrhea, what we recommend is that you take it with your meal to absorb that extra liquid during the digestive process becomes the watery or mushy bowel movements. Again, communicate with your healthcare team, find out from them if that's an appropriate step, but being aware of what the options are available to you. Probiotics, and there are a lot of different products that have probiotics available. You can see some of the yogurts here that we have found to be of benefit. You see the Benefiber caplets in the top left-hand corner. Again, work with your team to find out whether that's appropriate in your particular scenario. We find out when your diarrhea occurs. If it's after meals, kind of a dumping type syndrome, it may be appropriate to take your Imodium or your Lamotil a half an hour before you eat. Take a Benefiber when you eat. So working with them, understanding what the timing is and the frequency of your bowel movements will help them to really define a plan that works for you individually. Again, the um, common toxicity criteria for mucositis or the mouth sensitivity, functional is the oral mucosa. Your mouth looks normal. It does not feel normal. Ketchup burns, carbonated beverages burn, Drinking water can sometimes be a challenge. So a couple of different things with that as opposed to the clinical, which you'll get with the mTOR inhibitors, you may need a prescription of Nystatin or something to treat clinical mucositis. You may need IV hydration midway through your four weeks of sunitinib if you're starting to get dehydrated. We are very proactive about protecting kidney function. And I tell patients when they start sunitinib, and I tell the family member they have permission to tattle. Call me, let me know you're starting to get dehydrated. We would rather bring you in, give you an hour, two hours worth of IV fluids, keep you on therapy, it allows us an opportunity to get in the nutritionist, to work with your other medications, and to manage your side effects to keep you on therapy. Oral care, we wanna get you into a dentist if you haven't already seen one recently, or wait until the two-week interruption of Sutent or until your healthcare team tells you it's an appropriate time to get in to the dentist. If your blood counts are low, that's not a time for somebody to be poking and prodding around your gums. Frequent oral care, mouth rinses, salt water, soda water, tap water. It's the action of rinsing and spitting. There are a lot of tooth care, um, oral care products, a lot of toothbrushes out, a lot of toothpastes that are out there. Children's toothpaste works wonderfully. Doesn't burn, doesn't really irritate your mouth, but it's that oral hygiene that's really most important. So keep in mind, those are some of the creative ways that we can help you with your therapy. Taste changes, taste alterations, that metallic taste, foods don't taste right. And again, with this being a chronic therapy, trying to find ways to adapt, as the nutritionist said. You know, sometimes we're going to encourage you to add cream, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're going to suggest you try spices. Whatever works best for you is what we need for you to be able to get those calories and that nutrition in. And what you put in your mouth is one of the things you have control over. There's a lot of lack of control that goes along with this illness and frustration and discussions trying to help you find what works to eat. Go for it. Try it. Make it work. There are a lot of products out there. Ensure and Boost, while they're lactose-free as supplements, can sometimes aggravate the diarrhea. Drinking at room temperature may lessen that. We've also gone and looked and identified some of the clear liquids, such as Isopure. That product, and you want the one with the green label, the Isopure Nutrition, not the zero carb, but the nutrition is 15 grams of protein in eight ounces of a clear liquid. That's power packed. And it's not going to count against you because it's a clear liquid. It counts as a liquid and it counts as nutrition. So again, being aware of those things 
as well as Ben Calorie adds calories into the foods. It's an additive then that can be placed into your food. The dermatologic or the skin related side effects again, talking about hydrocyl 2 and the skin sloughing and things like that that occurred with hydrocyl 2. We have a variety of skin reactions and I can't tell a patient when I'm talking to them what their reaction may or may not be. So again, being aware of the hand foot syndrome that comes in particular with the VEGF inhibitors. When I worked with chemotherapy, 5-FU and some of the other chemotherapy agents, it was known as PPE or Palmer Plantar Erythrodysesthesia. That's redness of the palms and the soles. So that was the term that was used there. We use hand foot syndrome or hand foot skin reaction. And this is some of the variety of that hand foot syndrome you may see. It may wax and wane, it may come and go, it may get more severe, less severe. But those are things that you're not aware of when somebody says to you, hand foot syndrome. Or more importantly, the nurse, the oncologist said it would happen so you just deal with it. No, no, no. Call, let us work with you so that we can help minimize the impact of this. Because it can be difficult to golf, things like that. This one in the center is my skier who's been on Sutent for seven years. He was in the early clinical trials. He's no longer on that full 50 milligram dose. But again, he's on 25 milligrams, maintaining his dose and schedule that works for his disease. And those are his feet at times, and at other times he has no issues at all. So again, keeping up with it on a chronic basis. Preventative prophylaxis. We want to make sure you're doing good skin care up front. Look at your feet. If you can't get your foot up to look at it, your spouse will work with you. They'll deal with it. Do it after the shower when they're clean and friendly. <laughs> Concurrent approaches. It isn't just a one-size-fits-all. It's skin care. It's foot care. It's the disability placard. Anti-dandruff shampoos and occasionally steroids may work. And of course, we have treatment interruptions and or dose reductions. And a lot of times we may end up interrupting treatment or reducing the dose, not because of a single side effect that got out of control, but because of chronic or cumulative side effects. It's the fatigue and the diarrhea and the hand foot that causes the interruption or the dose reduction. This 3C approach, very, very simple, very easy. Control the calluses. Control them up front, control them concurrently with your treatment. Comfort with the cushions. There are a variety of insoles, good insoles in your shoes, changing your shoes. It may simply be that a shoe with a cute heel is just not gonna work. Flats with a good insole is more appropriate. Again, covering with creams. And there are a variety of different creams that are out there. There's a longer list than what I could begin to share with you. Look for products that can't contain dimethicone. Dimethicone is a moisture barrier. Look, peel that label back and look at what the percent of dimethicone in that lotion product is. That is what's going to provide you the most help. Those products that contain aloe are wonderful as far as moisturizers and taking away some of the sting. Again, um, the Gold Bond has in the turquoise bottle, that's a menthol-based product that's an anti-itch. So that may provide you relief as well. Head and shoulders, for anyone that's on serafinib and has the itchy scalp and the itching randomly, head and shoulders can be used not only as a scalp shampoo but as a body wash. And so that may help because of the product that's contained in that, pyrithicone zinc, may help reduce some of the itchiness as well as the dry skin that you may experience. Again, aloe and the um, bath and body shop, they carry not only that but they carry the hemp products. Um, so for those of you that don't want to try out the recipe, the body shop carries a hemp product. Again, let friends, family, what can I do for you? Do you have a body shop near you or do you have a body shop online? Go for it. Let them help you with those things. We may use steroids and we may use the um, anti agents such as Carousel or there are prescription strength products to help thin out the calluses that may come with therapy. So putting that on just to the callus area at bedtime because you don't want to debride healthy tissue, healthy tissue. So again, that's something to be aware of as well. One of the other key things, and again, expect this if you're on a VEGF inhibitor, class effect is hypertension. 
One of the most important things is to control it as well as possible prior to starting your therapy. And I put here to start as far as a systolic blood pressure, less than 150, diastolic less than 90. We'd love to have your systolic less than 140, but we're not necessarily gonna delay therapy. But if you're 168 over 90, we will put you in harm's way by starting you too quickly, nor will we be able to keep you on therapy. So if your oncologist says we're gonna wait a week to start your therapy, we gotta get your blood pressure under control, that week will all really help you maintain your therapy, more than the risk of delaying your treatment. But that's something that plays a little bit of an emotional game. Control it, follow the instructions that you're given, check it daily, check it twice daily, whatever they're instructing you to do, and whatever they give you your guidelines to for calling them. They should give you an individual based on your medical condition, do you have pre-existing hypertension or do you not? That's gonna give them some guidance as to what systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure is appropriate for you to notify them so that they can make changes in your medications. Weekly blood pressure once it's controlled, although even at that sometimes you may have to take it more frequently. And again, communication. The DASH diet. Okay, this is a guideline for reducing salt intake because salt has a lot to do with blood pressure, as the nephrologist spoke about earlier today. Something to be aware of as far as keeping track of what your daily salt intake is. Hypothyroidism can occur with some of the therapies. Your oncology team will monitor that before and during, particularly with sunitinib. And again, if you've had prior sunitinib, you need to make sure that your oncologist continues to monitor your thyroid function with subsequent therapy. Just because we stopped the sunitinib therapy doesn't mean that we're going to reverse immediately if you develop hypothyroidism. So something to be aware of as you continue with ongoing therapy. Some of the other VEGF inhibitors can uh, cause hypothyroidism as well. And so that needs to be monitored on an ongoing basis. The mTOR inhibitors, as you can see, Torcel, Affinitor, they've got that Tor in the trade name. So that will help you readily recognize that they're switching pathways and they're switching drug therapies. Therefore, your side effect profile is going to be somewhat different than it was with the VEGF inhibitors. That metabolic pathway increases in, in glucose, cholesterol, and triglycerides, and these are some of the numbers that we will use when we're monitoring your lab results to decide whether we need to initiate supportive therapy to reduce your triglycerides or to treat your blood sugar. Symptoms such as urinary frequency or excessive thirst, if you're on an mTOR inhibitor, should alert somebody that does not have diabetes that your blood sugar may be high. If you've got excessive thirst or you're constantly frequently going to the restroom, you want to let your healthcare team know that those things have developed. Those would alert them to check a blood sugar and a fasting blood sugar. Again, we typically will monitor them once a month. They may monitor them more frequently. Pneumonitis or interstitial lung disease is again a class effect, although rare, it can be very serious with the mTOR inhibitors. So we will always educate our patients to be aware of either a new onset of cough or shortness of breath or worsening of their current level or frequency of cough or shortness of breath. And that can be as simple as, I can normally go up a flight of stairs without difficulty. Now I'm having to slow down. And it may not be me that notices it, it may be my spouse that notices it. You know, you're taking longer to go up or we're at the library and I can go up faster than you. Be aware of that. It's important to catch these things early. We can interrupt your treatment, we can treat you symptomatically, and it may not become a treatment limiting side effect. So most importantly, early and ongoing communication. We use diary sheets. Whether you're on a clinical trial or not, we provide most of our patients with diary sheets simply because you have active lives and we want you to keep your lives that way. But we want to know what your blood pressure is. We want to know what your side effects are. And most of my work is going to be telephone triage. It's going to be communicating or playing phone tag with you. So if you, the patient can then call and say, I've taken six Imodium yesterday, five the day before, 
and I'm doing that on a consistent basis, then we know that we need to make some adjustments. But if we talk on Wednesday, 90% of my patients are not going to be able to tell me how many Imodium they took on Sunday. Because Sunday was four days ago. And I've had a lot of things going on in between. But that's important so that we know what our management strategies can be. We have a separate blood pressure diary sheet because we may be having you check your blood pressure more frequently. So again, having things that you can do to help us care for you. I tell patients, here's a diary sheet to mark side effects. Don't mark any of your routine meds. If you have nothing to say, don't fill it out. If you have lots to say, flip it over and just write on the back. Easy enough, but helps us work together as a team. Action plan, be an active part of your treatment plan. Allow your family members and friends to help, ask questions, contact your oncology team early as needed, keeping up with them and letting them know if something's working or not working. Let them know if you found a product that works well. That's how I got my list of things to share with you, is the patients that shared with me and educated me. Keep doing what you're doing. This is a gentleman that's been on exitinib for two years and nothing stops him. He keeps doing whatever it is he wants to do. My goal is to keep him doing those things. This is the institution I work at, the Cleveland Clinic Towson Cancer Center, and I thank you so much for sharing your afternoon and sharing your day, and I hope that I've been able to help. Wasn't that just phenomenal? Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your experiences with us. I'm sure all of us learned a great deal about management of side effects.